thank you. I'm so glad to be here, and I can't tell you what a relief it is to uh, 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 finally talk about this stuff. So, so <clears throat> this uh, seems loud. This, this thing is really, uh, the, the talk tonight, sometimes I'll read and sometimes I'll just be talking over the, the pictures. The talk tonight <clears throat> is quite literally a story about influence. It's a narrative with three characters, Aileen Nottleman, Lincoln Kirstein, and myself, or rather what they did to me. The doll of the title refers to the late work of Ailey Nottleman, hundreds of small plasters made between roughly 1930 and his death in December 1946. They were untitled throughout his lifetime, but since become familiarly known as the dolls. And my first idea was just to talk about the dolls themselves, which would have been simply a matter of appreciation, of historical appreciation. But for me, history is absolutely alive, practically menacing. And since that in itself is somewhat unusual attitude, as I asked myself how and why that's so, I saw that the story of influence is really a subject, and I should try to lay that there. But maybe no one sees influence bear. One can hardly feel it in the moment. Scholarship refers freely to it, but has, but has it ever looked at how it actually happens in the narrowest possible particulars? The artist would have to look back at the chain and speak up. As an artist, they've certainly been subject to plenty of influences. But in this one case, I can identify a powerful, long-lived, and lasting influence from the start and trace it from a place and date and item of origin. So the first thing is to introduce ourselves to Nottleman. <coughs> as as uh, we know him in, as New Yorkers, Great. <laughs> okay. So this is the the Gertrude Stein apartment. Uh, I don't know what year. Nottleman was in the circle of Gertrude Stein. It's the, the, that's where he first comes to public attention. And. Gertrude Stein wrote a, uh, a beautiful and amazingly insightful portrait of Nottleman, which I wish I had put out as a handout. She and her brother were uh, early patrons. And this piece uh, is actually uh, a portrait of Gertrude Stein and you really could say that it's the first of the dolls. It's got everything, it's got every characteristic, but the style of his later work. And this is the artist himself with the piece that people probably know well from the Garden of the Museum of Modern Art. And this is, I think, 1914. Uh, in his studio. And the next piece this is a, a photograph that he supervised of, the, of the, uh, the, the famous piece of the Whitney Tango. And this is 
Philip Johnson's Glass House and um, Untitled Paper Mache, which is, I mean, to me, really kind of, it's one of these things that really makes the house. It's a key element in, I mean, the, every last item in the house uh, is so carefully contrived, and, and the, uh, the big paper mache is so crucial. And these are uh, posthumous enlargements at the New York State Theater at Lincoln Center, also uh, Johnson's work. So this is probably how we all know Nottleman. Um, and each of these uh, pieces were placed in one way or another by Lincoln, who we'll meet later. Oops. And this is kind of where this, not kind of, this is where the story begins. This is the first piece that I saw in the home of a friend when I was, I believe, 19 years old, certainly not more than 20. And at that time, I was, uh, actually, I was not out of school. And people said, and this, this piece is about so big. And, you know, as I got serious about, uh, you know, my calling, my career, people would say, you know, well-meaning, naive people, family, et cetera, maybe, would say, well, you know, with your name and your big guy, yeah, you should be a sculptor. And I think they imagined I'd be working on some, you know, kind of uh, American 20th century scale large works. But as soon as I saw this, you know, I was hooked. This is her from a little bit behind and above. The same piece, you see a bit of the profile, which is almost non-existent. A little more of her face. The, the nose and that bare suggestion of a mouth are actually lower than her cheeks. He actually had to carve into the face to establish the nose. So, I mean, what, what was I so moved by? And the, an the answer is basically one word, the ambiguity. A deep ambiguity in uh, uh, style and theme and subject that makes such a deep complexity possible. All my life, the problem of survival in my work under my own hands is enough. What is ever enough? And this little thing at a glance, red, is inexhaustible. The artist had contrived a style of utter and liquid ambiguity. Everything went in. It was one small bit of matter containing multitudes. I would come to learn that he had traded, or rather retooled, a style of great precision and closure, gradually over many years previous, to be a vehicle of indefinition which more than allowed it invited over determination, thrilling and overwhelming. Of what all is in there, I still wonder. And I certainly did not know then, in a glance. And this is the kind of view of things I really love. It's the kind of view you have of a person beside you with head and shoulders in focus and the rest tapering away 
beyond. So, uh, although I, I have uh, friends, artists who mean so much to me and, you know, many times are older than me, the only person that I've ever considered a master would be Nodelman. But I find the word in, you know, to our purpose tonight is not appropriate. I, I don't, I mean, what word do you put? Uh, I, uh, the, the, the modern era is, has eliminated mastery in, the, in that old sense. Um, and I can't think of an appropriate word to put opposite. Student, pupil, apprentice don't work. Uh, Auden, in discussing that young poet, used the apprentice uh, opposite master. But this is more a matter of master and initiate. I was invited to an enterprise, not by a person, but by a, a thing, an item, and not to a community, and not by ceremony. I was touched by something I could pick up. And Nodelman did that. It's, you know, common sense, nuts and bolts, matter of fact. He, through that thing, he made that connection. He made that thing, but we never met. I was not on his mind as he worked, but the life of form, of the form was. He knew any one of hundreds of things of his making. Uh, might be met by a stranger and serve, literally serve, at a distance, at, at a remove in, in time and place as an agent to make this kind of invitation, which surely he had had himself. So that thing, that item is an agent of contact in the most literal way, like the tap of a hammer or the touch of a hand. And I didn't just pick it up, it reached me as something given. So whenever I've looked at that piece, I've thought of this picture of this lady on the left. There's, a, there's an element of uh, of reportage and, and uh, even satire. I think a mostly gentle satire in these pieces. The photograph is by Ouija, who's more or less Nolan's contemporary. And where the dolls come from, you basically, you could put these three elements together, an ancient figurine about the same size that he was working in, and contemporary life and contemporary imagery. This is a, a newspaper tear out of a particularly chubby child of which Nottleman, uh, you know, had who knows how many, hundreds. Um, this is kind of the, uh, the, the elements of this whole body of work. Old and new. And this is, this is a particularly, particularly elegant example of, um, of these kind of tear outs and the connection to the past that he made. The image on the right is a uh, page from his library with minimal um, uh, staining from uh, his uh, dirty hands in, in, at work. And in the center is a drawing of Nottleman's. I have no idea of the size, and probably no one knows where it is either. It was published in Kirstein's book. Um, it's a kind of a diagram of the elements of, 
all these dolls. It, it's quite similar to uh, the, the one you've seen so far. Legs together, very plumb, vertical, um, this kind of bow at the waist. There's an, I believe there's another in her hair, or there you know, almost always is, and some kind of, kind of catenary draped or crossed um, ornament and dress. You can actually see she has this enormous bow on her. She's almost like a, 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 a gift wrap present. Um, and then, of course, there's a, a, the Kooning on the right. The, the similarities are so uh, kind of striking and telling and, and uh, uh, rhyming. And, whoops. Oh. <laughs> now what? <laughs> there we go. So the next logical step is to uh, see all these things uh, at home, all at once, in situ, as they were. And that's the, that's the way to introduce Lincoln. This is the, the Nottleman home, Alderbrook, up in Riverdale, uh, photographed by W. Eugene Smith. Um, it's not my favorite photograph, but it has a certain kind of Gothic drama appropriate to the story because Lincoln, although he had made contact with Nottleman as a student at Harvard when he was uh, uh, curating exhibitions there and basically meeting everyone who would become the nucleus of the Museum of Modern Art, had never met Nottleman himself. And the story goes, he read his obit and went to the house unannounced, so far as I know, as Lincoln tells his own story, within a week of the artist's death. And there he met, apparently for the second time, the artist's widow, Viola Nottleman, who, I mean, should almost be named in this uh, circle of three. Um, she was really uh, at sea. Her husband had died suddenly. Um, the house was not in great shape. Um, uh, she needed all the help she could get. And she and Lincoln became quite close. Uh, he later said in acknowledgments to his last book, what I call the big book, that he had, that he, for as long as he was in the States, in the city, he went to Riverdale almost once a week and sometimes consecutive days and spoke with Viola on the phone, you know, that often, and at one point actually lived in the house. Nottleman was already kind of a hero to Lincoln. Uh, maybe already an exemplary artist. And this is, this is Lincoln as a young man at about that time. Actually, I think this is, yeah, it's a bit earlier. And Nottleman, uh, at the time that he was starting this late work in plaster. And these are, Lincoln's day books. I really wanted to know more about this initial visit. And I've done a lot of research in the past, but uh, I like doing research. And for this, I went for the first time to Lincoln's papers at the library at Lincoln Center. And I really hope to find some kind of diary, I hope to find correspondence, I hope to find some kind of spontaneous, uh, uh, you know, word of Lincoln's on why he was so moved, how he was so moved. And I have to tell you, you know, there's one place left to look, but basically we're not, I don't think we're gonna find it. And these day books, you know, I looked up and down uh, in, the day books for 46 and early 47. The artist died December 28th, 46. 
you know, a, a week would have been shortly after New Year's. It's not that hard to narrow it down. The pages are not missing. The entries are, you know, not even a line, they're a name. Like in the afternoon, thus and such a name. And there actually isn't an entry for the first week. Although they do accumulate later. So Lincoln had the run of the house. And he saw everything and began to put things in order. And I mean, fortunately for us, he did that, you know, not just as a conservator or a scholar, but as a poet. But as an intimate friend of the family, a scholar, a conservator, and a poet, he was necessarily, especially as a poet, he was necessarily a vandal. And we'll never see these things again as he saw them. And Cynthia happened to, this summer when we were meeting to look over one thing or another, she happened to bring me this folder which is labeled in Lincoln's handwriting. And this photograph, again, this is like, it's not a favorite of mine, but it has this, this drama of the first meeting and shock and what I imagine was a certain level of dismay. This is a photograph by Cartier Bresson, and it's clearly very early. Uh, it, you know, it can be fairly well dated, and it's early enough to be the more or less undisturbed studio. And it has this funny kind of uh, high flash, almost car headlight, overlit quality. which I kind of see, it's like this dramatic shock. Um, there are fortunately, and it's, there are fortunately other photographs take, also taken very early by Conrad Cromer, who was a friend of the artist, uh, of Ailey and Viola, Viola. They can't be dated precisely. But anyway, Nottoman had had this wonderful studio in a big uh, former coach house on the property, which at one, you know, which to begin with was an estate on the Hudson with a lawn that, you know, basically reached to the river. And after the crash, he, he lost the, uh, the, the studio, they lost, almost all the property, and he moved his studio to what apparently was a pantry behind the kitchen on the ground floor in the house. It's a studio, uh, you know, I mean, technically it's a studio, but it's not the site of all the work. Um, one of the things that evidently, uh, you know, uh, surprised and disturbed Lincoln is that in the artist's lifetime, the studio door was locked. But the thing is that at the same time, he was, he was basically using this room for mold making and storage and working upstairs in the house, in the open, uh, here and there, mostly in the library near a window. But, it was, but his, his work was no secret. And there were people around, that, you know, family was in and out of the room. Um, Jan, his son, told me that uh, he would sometimes, you know, come home from something social and just sort of pick something up and start working on it. Um, it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's significant and it's, and it, it's also uh, uh, the 
something uh, not to be taken at face value that, 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 that the back room was locked and that he, had, he carried the only key. So these photographs for me, as, as you know, moved and involved as I am with this work, you know, are just like uh, endlessly interesting and I pour over them in great detail. In this photograph, you can see how, I mean, we, we really can't be sure who arranged these, but you can see the, uh, the continuity in theme and in pose, continuity and development and variation in these things. And the means of that were uh, mold making and casting. And particularly, let me go back one. Oh no, I went, what did I do? Oops. Whoops. Here we go. Um, in this shot, oh, now. Here, we can make out, what is it? It's more than a half dozen fresh black castings. Uh, these castings are not plaster. A lot of the castings were plastiline. The earliest work of this kind, the first things, the first step was a piece in soft material in oil-based clay, plastiline, from which he or an assistant would make a mold and the mold could generate plasters, which he worked on by carving, or further soft castings, which could be reworked by modeling or carving. He, in the library, he worked with these, uh, these big old scholarly art books, which a friend of mine who's, who's you know, a very good scholar of antiquities says, oh, yeah, these are basic works of the time. Um, he worked with these books open and thumbed through them and left these black plastiline stains and smudges and even, you know, gobs, these pellets of plastiline all over them. And when they're open today, they still smell strongly of this stuff. But the, but the item that's most heavily marked is not a, a library page, but this mounted picture uh, which was sent to him from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston of uh, ancient Greek terracotta eroi, or uh, that's the, the Greek plural, or, or we, would, we would say erases. They're winged figures. And they had so many of the formal characteristics of, his, of so much of, not all, but so many of these, uh, of, of the dolls, that, that kind of uh, tapering leg, the, the indefinite foot, the relatively large head, which is you know, obviously uh, and predominantly childlike. And many times this sort of funny, uh, kind of bucolic dress of uh, a shepherd, uh, uh, and, and the, the headgear the same. Um, but they're all winged figures, and of course his figures are, are all wingless, which is a kind of a fundamental jump from ancient to modern. Another view of the studio, and here we see uh, among pieces of his own these ancient fragments, uh, Tanagra and elsewhere, which Lincoln mentioned. Oh, let me go back once. Uh, Lincoln mentioned that Nodelman, in the, in the course of explaining, you know, how 
erudite, how knowing and, and uh, you know, learned was an Ottoman, says that he had Tanagras at his workbench. But, okay, so here they are. You know, once again, Lincoln has, has it right. But the thing is, this isn't a workbench. Um, there really is no indication of an Ottoman, and, and this Tanagra, this, whoops, sorry, this piece on the right is apparently a fragment that fits right here. Uh, I, I didn't identify this, this fragment elsewhere on the table, but who cares? Here you see this kind of horned feature that appears, that, that we'll see uh, appearing over and over in the, in the dolls. Um, there's, there's no indication that Nottman worked in this space other than to make an open mold and as this sort of uh, storage point. I think part of the reason he kept it locked uh, is simply a, a matter of privacy, just not wanting anyone to pop in. Although, uh, you know, people, uh, the, you know, the uh, uh, cook and like uh, cleaning lady, people did move through the house and did pass through here. Um, uh, some of it, I think, has to do with the fragility of these pieces and just, you know, a, a matter of privacy. And also, I think th there is some element of there being especially intimate work that he did protect in a way that he hadn't before. These things really are a departure. Um, in this, whoops, sorry, in this photograph, we see a full black bag of plaster on the floor under the table. Oh, and these are the black plastiline uh, duplicates that we saw in the other shot. And these are these sort of very rudimentary um, molds for, for the simplest kind of piece, like the, the first one I showed that are really uh, simple double-sided forms that you could make a, a, a double-sided mold and uh, uh, rather than a more complicated piece mold, which we can see here, this sort of boxy mold, is a much more sophisticated thing which takes a lot of patience, a lot of care, and I'm perfectly sure the Nottleman did not go through all that fuss and bother himself. But I do suspect that he did make these ones himself, which are really quite rough and ready and quick and dirty, uh, and many of which would only uh, be used once. Th this is, uh, these are piles of uh, plastiline that probably have been just pulled out of the mold. These are plastiline duplicates in the mold. And those molds that have been used for plastiline are, are, have got that <coughs> that black oil stain. And then here you see a saw, which with, you make a, uh, a cut most of the way around this, where you think the parting line should be from front to back. And then basically just drive in a wooden wedge or something and open it up. Uh, there isn't an open one laying here, but here's the brush with which you would uh, knock out the crumbs of plastiline Here's the kind of rasp that he used on the, uh, the cast plasters. And here are, are an ancient mold and a uh, casting. This is an ancient mold, a broken, more or less the way his, uh, that Tanaga we saw earlier is broken at the waist and a casting in the Museum of Munich at the Antikensammlung, which, which uh, Nottemann haunted in his uh, somewhat less than a year in Munich before he got to Paris. And this is one of these oil-stained uh, molds that has uh, given up a plastiline duplicate. It has these very simple um, uh, dimples that, that keep the mold in register. And at the bottom, you can see where uh, that wedge was dr driven in and broke away a piece of the mold. Um, 
I take the dolls as a work in and of themselves, you know, with a kind of internal consistency, uh, of, uh, you know, although, although they're so various of, of, of uh, theme and method, uh, that are really, apart from any purpose they might have had, are, are self-sufficient and, and, uh, and, and end in themselves. But the fact is that they started to a purpose when Nottoman lost that big studio uh, in 1930, I believe, he, although he'd made some large pieces, some architectural commissions recently, he didn't work on larger pieces again and turned to working in additions of smaller pieces in ceramics and paper mache, uh, a lot of work that had been in that studio, the story goes, did not survive because the movers showed up maybe unexpectedly and put the stuff on the curb and it was destroyed. A lot of the, the stuff that did survive was moved into the house. That was the last refuge into these attic rooms and the cellar. The cellar actually consumed a number of things. Uh, the, the attic was safe. And these things that you see hanging are uh, on the shelves and hanging are uh, these fired ceramic uh, additions. All the way here as well. I always love this. You see this glass doorknob. That's what close quarters the photograph was taken. That's the door to the room. Um, and then here are the carved uh, cherry wood pieces from the 20s, which are now quite valuable and, and pretty well known. These two big pieces are the models for uh, the Lincoln Center pieces. And the one at rear is, is uh, I don't know if that's the very one that went to the glass house, but that is the piece. And these are modern photographs of a paper mache on the right and a, uh, a, a glazed ceramic piece on the left. The style is, uh, is kind of the platform for the dolls. He had found this way of you know, in a really smooth, continuous envelope of implying uh, the features that were not visible in and of themselves, <clears throat> and often brought out by this, this overpainting in, in glaze or in paint. And this is a, an unpainted and a painted paper mache. And now we come to, we come back to the dolls. In photographs that apparently, it's, it's not clinched, but apparently were uh, supervised by Nottleman himself. All the best photographs of his work were supervised, and they're really good. And they're so, uh, uh, so uh, elusive and insightful and psychologically telling. Uh, these, these ones are kind of remarkable because uh, Lincoln poses them as male figures, which, you know, I have not seen the pieces for myself, but it, it's like, it's nearly wishful thinking. A, a, a funny thing about the, the dolls is that they're the farthest male they range is to androgyny. They're almost completely uh, female. And it's a darn good question why they're always girls. And these pieces are about 10, 12 inches high, which uh, for these works, they're big. 
these are also uh, apparently supervised photographs, and in the middle is a tear out um, cropped by Lincoln. That we can be pretty sure that the edges, that the, the, the margins were, were free. And this, uh, this layout comes from Lincoln's book, which we'll come to shortly. <clears throat> Uh, these photographs in this con and uh, and the the, uh, the, uh, the selection brings home this point that that the dolls are almost you know certainly and almost exclusively children. And why is another? Good question. I mean, it's not something that I haven't thought about a whole lot, and, or and you know read about, uh, and I have no idea about. But it's one of these things that's really kind of uh, a matter of such uh, you know of interpretation of such kind of un unfathomable material that we only have an hour. We won't, we won't go to. Um, you know, Lincoln says that um, among the very last things that Nolan worked on were these uh, sort of caped and hooded figures. And he, I mean, he knows things, you know, we'll never know, we'll never check. Uh, he's probably right. Lincoln was, you know, I think almost pathologically uh, honest and factual. And there's that arrangement of the, that vertical arrangement of the, the bow in the hair, the bow at the waist, and these funny, I mean, like, what are, whoops, what are these kind of lobed forms? They, you know, they appear in the ancient terracottas and they're magical. And what they are in the present, I mean, that can be her, her hairdo. But the echoes, you know, are deliberate and just uh, intrinsically and, and uh, 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 unsolvably mysterious. Whoops, did it again, damn it. What did I, oh, there we go. So um, this is another supervised photograph of a figure that interestingly, uh, Lincoln calls out as a uh, child hyphen god. Uh, the, the, some of the previous ones are child goddess. Um, when I was doing my own uh, you know, study here and there, and, and over the years, I, I had this strong feeling that, you know, like he's, he's looking at, at babies. And happened to find at, at some point, you know, years into it, this, this scrapbook page, the reverse of, a, uh, of an illustration that Lincoln used. And there it is, you know, it's, it's, it's clinched. Uh, the, the faces are nearly always, uh, just about flat. The heads are very large, right? I mean, oops, I don't want uh, I, I did the arithmetic. I think this is like uh, close to one to four. And, uh, you know, well proportioned adult is about one to seven, head to figure. Um, and yet, I mean, it's not, uh, you know, a, a, a person at that age, you know, is, is uh, it, it's remarkable if they stand, let alone take such a pose and wear, you know, these kind of clothes, which have this, um, you know, contemporary burlesque uh, rhyme. And this is, uh, this, on, on the right is, uh, you know, I mean, like perhaps my, my favorite doll I've never I've never actually seen I've no idea where it is um, and on the left 
a fairly well thumbed page from the library uh, of death goddesses. Uh, you know, these, uh, you know, rhymes and, and uh, uh, echoes between <clears throat> ancient and modern and, and, uh, and the contemporary scraps and, and his work are not, you know, they're, they're not uh, perfectly definite and certain and they're not, uh, they're, they're not precise, they're opportunistic and, uh, and not literal, but I mean, and at the same time, there it is. Um, It's all quite unstable. And this is Lincoln's big book, his last publication on Ottoman, the last of, I think, four and numerous articles and mentions and all kinds of things that he'd got in place. And he'd had so many photographers uh, out to the house. He, he wrote the catalogs, the, the Museum of Modern Art catalogs for Walker Evans and, and Smith and for Cartier-Bresson. And uh, George Platt Lynn was a, a personal friend and, and all these people and more um, he uh, led out to the studio. Uh, this is the last and biggest and sort of the, the wind up some nation book. Um, I, it always interests me that like, you, you rarely actually see Christina Nottleman's name, you know, on the same page. And, and here, there it is. I mean, and the, and the title, not a, you know, a study of, a life of, the work of, etc. It's just those two names. And that little uh, preposition by, it's you know, Lincoln, you know, as, as frank and brusque and blunt as he was, he, there was this recessive uh, element as well. And this sort of, uh, you know, this kind of um, uh, gothic, dramatic, um, you know, animistic uh, view of Nottleman's work and of, of, of the, the home and the house, uh, which I kind of associate much later, actually begins with Lincoln. Lincoln is the first guy to make the archaeological reference and even to say something like, you know, the studio is a, is a kind of a the fine sight of a, of a lost religion, of a lost cult. And it's significant that he puts this picture on the cover, this shadowy picture with the bare trees out the, you know, beyond the, the, the uh, curtained windows. And this is the, f the, the first page. Page two, there's, there's a, a title just before it. It's a photograph of Nottleman from 1914, I believe, when he was 33 in Paris. This extraordinarily handsome man who's known as Nottleman Le Beau. And beside it, a drawing that actually goes back just about as far on an old envelope which somehow made it all the way back to Riverdale, probably years later, after the First World War, um, when Ottoman sent for uh, things he'd left behind. And they're both classical profiles. I mean, they, they could be, you know, in the, the sense of the, 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 the silhouette of, of uh, of Praxiteles, but the identification is personal. There's no, 
those two little numbers, one and two, the very first images in the book, no caption, no words, no introduction. They, it's, you see the shadow of an Ottoman's portrait through the title page, his name is, is over it, and you see this rectangle through the page. <clears throat> You know, this, this is Lincoln's poetry. He's willing to let this thing stand completely on these pictures. And the implication is that the artist is, in himself, is classicism, is the Greek ideal. And, you know, and, and it's somewhat a matter of fact, with some irony, with some wit and humor and even pathos, I think, that's what I see in that profile, in the, the profile drawing on the envelope. I don't want to lose these notes entirely. And, you know, for all the things that Lincoln wrote and all the, the articles and essays he placed and the interviews here and there, this book is, which I won't refer to the text, I mean, it's another kind of uh, bottomless subject. And as eloquent as it is, it's also sometimes like practically incoherent. It's like the thoughts person has in the middle of the night, they're, you know, wakened out of a sound sleep. Um, the, 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 the book as, a, as an object and as something visual is more coherent than the words, more coherent than the text. And this is the next page, um, a quote from <clears throat> Pythagoras. It's a beautiful quote. It seems to start at the very beginning of all things. It's a, you know, it's like a, the first line, the principle of all things is the monad or unit. Arising from this monad, the undefined dyad or two serves as the material substratum to the monad, monad which is cause. Um, The implication, you know, by placement and uh, it's pla uh, by placement in the book and placement on the page, and in, and in sequence, with no other introduction but this, this classical fragment out of nowhere, is that sculpture is the essence of matter itself, and art is a philosophical inquiry. And by his work, the artist is making an inquiry, seeking an understanding of nature in itself. The principle of all things is one thing, and plastic form is an expression and a result of the unity of nature in itself, which all sounds right to me. And the next page. I mean, at this point, we're, we're this, this book, uh, you know, apart from the, the sort of vision of that first little piece, uh, was the medium between Nottleman's work and me. Um, it was an expensive book. Um, it's been referred to as one of the most sumptuous art books ever published. And when I first saw it, uh, you know, I, I wasn't allowed to move it out of its room in the library. Um, eventually, I had a copy of my own 20 years later. Um, and this is one of any number of pages that I could uh, present that just shows this wonderful economical and kind of mysterious purely visual poetry of Lincoln's. Again, you know, no captions. You have to retreat through many pages to get back to where the captions are, and they're so brief. Um, 
the implication is like, I mean, it's like the, 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 the so-called uh, title on the cover of book, it, it's just Alien Ottoman. It's just the mind of Nottleman that everything, uh, you know, new and old, recent and ancient, is in one level of awareness in this one mind. Of, at, the, at the left is a classical fragment. It's actually a roof tile fragment. In the middle, a, a tear out, which is uh, from the reverse of the scrapbook page we saw. And on the right, a, uh, a piece of Nautilus from the 20s. And here are the kind of captions. You know, sometimes it tells you where they are, sometimes not. The dates are often circa dates. Uh, the, the titles, many of the things are ancient. They're, they're not actually titles. Um, the implication is that, that all these things are uh, out of the artist's head as, as much as they are real things in the world with uh, uh, you know, provenance and ownership and location. Where am I? Uh, this quote I think we don't even need. I'm kind of losing my place a bit. So that's the, the method and the nature of Lincoln's book, the summation of 25 years of, of uh, devotion to this man he never knew. Um, and now we're coming <clears throat> uh, up into my era. This is a uh, photograph from 84 uh, by Peter Hooger that was published in an article by Klaus Curtis in Art Forum. Uh, Klaus is one of the first people to write about the dolls in and of themselves. And I think one of the best things he ever did for the subject was bringing Hooger to the house. The story goes that uh, 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 Jan, the artist's son, living there at the time, was kind of startled because Hooger just kind of scooped these things up and went outdoors with them. And this is one of the most puggish of the puggish style dolls. Oops. Another one's a great favorite. It's always struck me, I, uh, you know, like the other image reminded me of Ouija. This one always reminds me of the, um, of, uh, the face of Maria Teresa Walter in uh, Picasso from the 30s. And this is a piece, I don't see pencil markings, but this is a piece that's clearly, it's a plaster casting that's heavily reworked. Uh, with a, a knife and a, a rasp. Uh, th these parallel marks are rasp marks. And you can see that they go, the tool marks go through, these are parting lines in, from the casting. And the tool marks cross them. And again, this funny, I mean, that thing. And this uh, conical hat is a, a common classical feature. It's a kind of a uh, kind of peasant sun hat against the strong sun of Greece. And this is uh, Christine on the, on the left by Penn and on the right from a passport photo from 69. On the right is the guy, it, uh, on the left is, is the guy who, you know, lived and, and uh, you know, studied and, and uh, you know, worked so hard through those 
25 years for an Ottoman. And on the right, the guy who wrote the book, who's recognizably the guy that, that, that I met, uh, kind of startled and startling and a little manic. Uh, it's, you know, for, for me, the, the fellow on the left is this kind of the, the stylish cosmopolitan Lincoln about town, and on the right, uh, this manic, cranky, demonic poet. So I uh, published my first piece about an Ottoman in 89, um, uh, you know, basically out of the, what I could find in the library of the Museum of Modern Art and Lincoln's, like everyone else, from Lincoln's publications. And um, when it was over and done and, and uh, published, I sent him a copy, you know, at kind of like a general delivery address at the, uh, the, uh, uh, the New York Ballet, and, uh, you know, put it in the mail the next day there in the, the Metropolitan section, Lincoln Kirstein just retired, and I said, thought to myself, oh, well, you know, there, there went that. Um, but uh, about a month later, he wrote back to me, and, uh, uh, you know, really very nice letter, and, um, you know, said it would be great to, to, to talk, and you could come over, and so we did meet. And this guy is recognizably, the, the, this uh, photograph on the right. This is the guy I met who, who was almost 20 years older, so he really was uh, an older, an, a, a, you know, an old, you could say, old, old man. He'd been tall and slender, and, you know, uh, I would never say to Lincoln was debonair. He had this kind of crazy edge, uncomfortable edge. But, uh, but the guy that I met, you know, as tall as he'd been was, was was stooped and, uh, you know, al almost, you know, walking in short steps and, um, and still had an agenda. So 80-something, and, you know, uh, really, generous to me, I'll, I'll always remember it, I'll always treasure it. And he had an agenda, he had a purpose. I've, you know, on this, uh, you know, kind of, toward this poetic concept of his, of, of uh, art and artist, and was angling to make a recruit. and. I was not naive about it. I, you know, I'd read him. I was, uh, uh, you know, aware <clears throat> that, for instance, he pretty much entirely dismissed abstraction. Um, for instance, you know, he he had kind of a, you know, a, a lovers' quarrel with 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 modernism uh, altogether. So I was a bit wary. Um, And Lincoln could be destructive. In fact, as much as he had done for photography, I'm thinking especially of Walker Evans, who, who at that time was a, was a, a, you know, a special favorite, greatly admired by me, personal friend of Lincoln's. Um, he waved photography away with his hand, literally. And I can still hear this word for word. Oh, it's superficial. It's thin as the paper it's printed on. He's swishing his whiskey. He'd, you know, right away asked me if I like whiskey, and it was much to my uh, advantage with him that I do. Made us each a, a good, strong one. And that statement, um, you know, cranky as it is. Can't agree with it, but I love it. 
as a position, you know, as a position one might take, and that for him to have taken it, one position of many in a lifetime, and one knowing that one day I'm going to be an old, old man too, looking at a threshold, and I hear it now as this kind of passionate explosion of a guy who on this poetic level is grasping as hard as he can for solids. And another thing that I remember, word for word, tone of voice, everything, he said that glass in his hand, I like an art that's hard and definite. And I love that too, <laughs> in, in you know, the same uh, sense. Especially given that the, the, the dolls, the subject for our getting together, you know, my s school of Athens are everything but hard and definite. So, you know, the story of influence, I have to uh, summarize, you know, I'm referring to, I have to summarize Lincoln's concept of an ideal art and, and an exemplary, an ideal artist. And the thing is, you know, among this, this pawing around research I did, for this time around, uh, you know, you can't find it. Out of all these things he wrote on all kinds of subjects and this kind of exhaustive history of dance that he wrote, and it has so much to do with dance, nowhere is this thing laid out in so many words. And it's self-contradictory. I mean, apart from being cranky, it contradicts itself. It's, it's a practical matter. It's impossible as a personal thing. I mean, no one would submit to it, especially an artist. And I'm sure Lincoln was somewhere aware of that stuff because he really was, I can't say it often enough, he really was a poet himself. So, you know, I scrawled and re-scrawled this thing and scrawled it again on the train on the way down. And uh, there's, there's much more to it. There's, you know, the statements and implications here and there. But I, you know, I, I'm so far from agreeing or, or being willing or able to employ it all. I, th I scratched out these three key elements. Uh, First of which, the artist must have an absolute command of his hands and materials, this kind of digital mastery that, that Lincoln would refer to. <clears throat> Fair enough. But, uh, you know, mastery is wonderful, um, but if effective is enough. And no one, and one doesn't have all this mastery in advance, doesn't need it. And Nottleman himself, who had an amazing dexterity, you can see it in his handwriting. And he was a wonderful skater and, uh, you know, just a graceful guy in every way altogether. Um, himself didn't have this mastery. And, and himself did not have, did not made this kind of apprenticeship and had not been, actually not had been anywhere where it would have been taught. It's, uh, it's a fiction, a poetic fiction, a useful fiction. Um, it's not literal. And next, it's paraphrasing, uh, compressing kind of idea that the artist has to know everything, everything, that it's all in his head. He's seen it all. He's, uh, you know, the, the collections of places like the, the Louvre and, and the, the collections that Nottleman knew at Munich are committed to memory. Instantly uh, re uh, uh, retrievable at will and repeated almost 
thoughtlessly, almost unconsciously, in echo of their original form. And again, you know, this is, it's, it's, it's theory, and, and Lincoln had a way of posing these things sometimes as if they were almost like military doctrine, and, and artists and poets were, you know, kind of uh, cadets in a, in a, uh, you know, a, a almost military society. But it's fiction, and, and not to be taken, I think, perfectly liter literally, even uh, by Lincoln. And Nodelman, again, like the tests of Nodelman himself, on whom so much of this is based, more than anyone else that Lincoln knew personally or knew of, uh, Nodelman himself didn't have this kind of knowledge. You know, by now, I've been to some of those places, and I'm familiar with those collections, and familiar with his his books in which you know the plates are marked up and and uh, and smelling strongly and the the text is clean. <laughs> um, Nodelman himself, as an artist, you know was was opportunistic and had an a had an agenda, uh, an enthusiasm, an urgent need which he met with anything, everything at hand, in any way he felt like. And that categorical knowledge, I think, is really something to be attained to, you know, as a kind of a museum without walls, the kind of thing that's posed so eloquently in the book, visually, purely visually, And it's one's, as an artist, it's one's inheritance. And the third element, uh, which I find credible and useful and, uh, you know, I've made in some form my own, That, that one's practice is ritual and repetitive, like, like a dancer, like, a, like ballet exercise. And I mean, this seems to be a performing arts, uh, purely performing arts metaphor, but it's applicable in visual arts and in, in sculpture readily in terms of mold making, casting, reworking, more mold work, more mold making, further casting, more reworking. It's exactly analogous to um, uh, the, 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 the use and reuse of the forms in that museum without walls. And ritual, you know, in whatever form, is magical and unpredictable and provocative. The the ordinary, you know, workaday use of the of the of the mold and the casting can be magic ritual. So I fully realize that these uh, these concepts are, are uh, you know as, as cranky as they are, but I know that one can make something of it. As Lincoln composed it out of what he found and and Nodelman before him, and so do I. Uh, 
time for a picture, no? So these are uh, photographs I took uh, this summer of very small plasters. This is, this is uh, three views, the same piece. On the back, you see these, uh, the, 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 the fingerprinted pallets of plastiline that it started from as this almost inchoate lump. And you can see from the middle and the side view that they're, they're almost three-sided. Uh, I don't think there's any of these pieces that really has a, a fully developed or, and, and many of them not even a, a coherent back. And you can see that it's one thing made of another. Um, this figure started from something else and he literally whittled some, you know, other arm, a whole new pose out of a larger chunk of plaster. Close up of the same piece. And you can see that this kind of thing, you know, it went this way, it went so far, and it could have gone in any direction. And might have been picked up, you know, as it probably was picked up already, again and again, <clears throat> any number of times and gone anywhere. The artist's own repetitive work is an archeology span no less removed and strange and provocative than some thing out of the ground. Thinking of a, a found object, a, sh a shirt, an archaeological find. <clears throat> they might as well have come from someone else. And for the artists, they quite literally do. I couldn't possibly do today what I did yesterday. I could only marvel at it or cry. And one of the things that I so value in these is, is this in conclusion, uh, in and of itself, I couldn't care less for closure except to further, to hold it in further contempt. Closure, essence, absolutes, you know, so many lies, pernicious lies. And how could anyone credit them today? The world is, is nothing but something indefinite, inessential. And chaotic. It's all we have. And ambiguity for an artist is the staff of life. And this is a piece I'd never seen before this summer. I felt like I had to show you how tender these things can be. And this is a good glimpse of kind of Pascal uh, element in the dolls. Yet another thing that Lincoln quoted out of his thin blue air, um, Nottleman's copy, the marked copy of Pascal that Lincoln refers to still exists. But the, the quotes, that, the, 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 uh, the sections, and of course Pascal's, the, the pensées are you know, themselves such a mess. All over the map, you know, numbered by others, written on little scraps. They're like dolls. They were written on little scraps of paper and scattered all over and collected and numbered by others. And the thing that, I, of course, I looked at Pascal again uh, for this purpose this evening. And what I get from him is this eloquent sense of the vast tininess of man. A child and an infant in 
time and space and in his awareness. As Pascal says, these vast spaces terrify me. And we don't know precisely what he's referring to, but it's so telling. And it's one of those things that reading it or one of those things that like I see here or there on TV or some object or something in a museum or something I read and I say, this is the matter, the stuff of the dolls. Um, I think the dolls actually clarify that fragment of Pascal. Their numerousness, their smallness, their frailty, their vulnerability, their contingency, their inadequacy is ours as human beings. And moving rapidly, childlike, baby-like, uh, contingent and fragile being expressed with so much tenderness. Um, these are my molds. We won't linger over them. I don't think there's hardly anything homelier on earth than a mold. But they're like the ancient molds, they're two-sided. And this is a mold for a male figure. Uh, and it's a soft casting. There's clay pushed into the mold, scraped away level. When it's green enough to be pulled out, the two halves can be put together with a little water. And you have instantly a full figure. And it's a soft casting. It can be bent any way and skewered with enough wires, triangulated enough. Uh, you can make it stand or you know, take whatever pose. And this is the kind of thing that I can get from it. This is a, a detail from a, a set of, I forget, it's nine, 10, 11 figures, male figures, that were uh, shown on a, a kind of a blank replica of Freud's desk um, in his consulting room in situ that kind of stand in for his collection of terracottas. And on the right, this, the, and you know, ritual and repetition, they all take very close to the same pose and you know, with inflection and variation, do the same thing with their hands, sort of um, you know, create this, this vacant, uh, space, which has relations to a particular piece of Freud's that I was involved with, uh, an unpublished manuscript. Um, and, ah, and the thing is, When uh, I decided to work from this method of the ancients and of Nottleman, I also decided to take this kind of swerve, a, a Bloomian swerve, uh, in the sense of Harold Bloom's anxiety of influence, that the, the, the poet uh, accepts uh, and defends himself from influence. And, I really wanted my, I wanted my figure's legs to open up and for them to, uh, you know, really stand and have an, art, an articulate carriage and a kind of, a, you know, a more athletic uh, agency. But that, you know, that very swerve is evidence of my, uh, you know, connection to Nottleman. I'm leaving out a lot. It always happens. Can't be otherwise. This is another piece that was shown in the Freud apartment. It's a gisant, a, a French word for a reclining tomb figure that uh, uh, imitates the, in, you know, a very uh, literal, lifelike way, 
imitates the, the deceased. And it comes from that same mold. So it gives you an idea of uh, uh, how divergent and uh, various the products of the mold can be. And this piece I considered, it has a kind of a, the, the, the piece had broken up and firing the whole uh, upper half uh, splintered away and, and had to be rebuilt in plaster. And it acquired this, uh, you know, kind of bird-like beak and I considered it a, a winged figure, uh, you know, maybe somehow, uh, you know, folded and, and wrapped which was another echo of the origin of the dolls in those winged figures. And that uh, then I was invited to contribute something to um, the, the Kyoto Biennial Par Sophia, and I decided to take the, the uh, it so worked out haphazardly, that I decided to take that, that chisant form. And uh, when they showed me these big, really big glass vitrines, I immediately saw a really big chisant. And, then asked them, they showed me one, it was kind of crammed into this loading dock. And then I asked them if there was possibly a second one. They said yes. And then immediately I saw uh, two figures, male and female, in two vitrines. And this, uh, th this, is a, this is a, you know, exemplary, Paris Jesants in at Saint Denis in Paris, uh, Henry II and Catherine de Medici, and I had them on my mind <clears throat> for this concept. Uh, the figures were made for the vitrines, and whoops, and these are the pieces I made for the vitrines, they're really big. Um, the vitrines are almost 12 feet long. And they're essentially uh, two beings of a species unique to themselves. The, the title is Liebespar, it's a German word um, it, it's, it's kind of unique, doesn't really translate. It's a, it's a couple. And they can't be with, you know, the, a species of two, they can't be with anyone else. And yet, at some point, like us all, they're separated by force. And for me, this, this lane, this walking space between the vitrines was charged with, uh, you know, this kind of tension between them. They were really hard to photograph. This is a photograph of the female, um, female of the species. Once I had them both underway at the same time, and between the two of them, I basically filled the room I was working in. I was moved to make them each closer to a single sex of some kind, still opposite in gender, but similarly formidable and physically intimidating, all of which had to be invented. I realized then that I was back to the androgyny I'd noted in the first Nottleman essay, and later it called an old man's game. And now younger, 
I mean, as a younger man, I'd envied it and couldn't do it for myself. I tried. And now older, it had arrived unannounced. And one night, working, I realized that I'd come right around to intentions that I'd, intentions I'd posed for myself long ago, years ago. And in the process, not lost, but practically forgotten. And at this point, I had derived a long extension from an original, many generations of various and divergent figures at different occasions and to different purposes. employing given forms stronger than myself and larger than I could see or know. Before I had understood how much I was already touched by the dolls, I had set out quite deliberately to employ the method. And I had not undertaken a project of indefinition and striving toward no conclusion, but I had gone there nevertheless. And that night, I realized that I was between, standing literally between the biggest dolls ever made. And more recently, <clears throat> earlier this year, I came back to this kind of fallen flying figure and deliberately applying this method, well, it's a reflex, it's a routine, it's a ritual for me now of casting and variation and repetition, um, kind of dug into this thing which rapidly began to accumulate and these are a couple of the best, the most articulate so far at the feet of an ancestor, standing figure from the same mold from which they ultimately derive, and a solid plaster um, cast from the, the Vienna Chizant mold and carved away with a hatchet and a, furiously for the size, I mean, holding it in one hand and hitting it with a hatchet in the other, I have yet to hurt myself. Um, the hatchet, the rasp, the knife, and, and uh, uh, just beginning, you know, with a bit of sandpaper like Nottman so frequently did. And not seen in this photograph, a, a more bird-like tail. <clears throat> and which is which, I don't really recall, but it's immaterial. I worked back into the earliest ones with, with what I learned from the latest ones, so they're all mixed up. But on a fairly uniform scheme so far, much like that uniform vertical scheme of, of the dolls. They aren't, uh, there's problems, uh, you know, this one's actually pretty good, but there's problems about how to make a head or, or a, a face for, a, you know, a, a heterogeneous, creature like this, it's still inconcluded, and the solution in part is indefinition and ambiguity. These things can't possibly be literal. They are not birds and they're not men or women. They're not maquettes. They could be life-size as they are, which is, I mean, you see the scale. I don't know, they're like, they're probably 14, 15 inches. Um, but they could also be big. They could be as big as those Kyoto figures. They could be, you know, 9, 10, 11 feet in length. 
I very much doubt, it's my educated doubt, that they would make any sense at any size in between. They couldn't be depictions, they couldn't be literal. Um, which would violate a set of uh, necessary and sufficient fictions, you know, which live and thrive on this indefinition and ambiguity. Now, we're leaving something out that I feel like I really, I, I'm sorry for my, uh, for having to take you back. There's something I don't want to miss. This thing about using and reusing forms from the past, um, and the forms being stronger than oneself, so much older and so much stronger, so much more resonant than one even realizes. Um, it's a matter of one maker today, in, you know, present in, in our moment, one maker patiently trying another's thing one more time around and kind of saying to him or to the, to the form, let's, may we try this once more. I see your intent. May we make some adjustment. May we, may we make some correction and make this clearer. And in doing that, the artist's project is a, it's not, it's no longer just an I thing, it's this we thing. Recognized or not, we engaged in a project, a process, an enterprise that is passed from one hand to the next. In this language of form alone, no words, articulate, complete statements, grammatical statements without words, passed one item to the next, as if each form, each is saying to the next fellow, to the maker, to you know, me, for instance, from that little doll in my friend's house, here, try it. Try it again. Make it right. One more time. And now, at last, I'm afraid I'm trying your patience. We're coming to the end of the last four slides, and we go back to Nodelman. I can only figure out this clicker. Um, this summer, Cynthia, the artist's granddaughter, um, a, uh, a, 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 a essayist, a, a poet, an editor, uh, and the biographer of the artist, who's come to be, you know, a treasured friend of mine gave me one of these pieces. You can kind of imagine how much this means to me. How, I mean, it's literally like life changing. I'm not the same person, you know, the, the afternoon that she gave me that piece. And, and she set out four and she said, you know, uh, you know, you know, what, what, you know, Pick one. What what you know? What what rings for you? And it was a, and it was a fairly easy choice. There were pieces that were more classical, um, you know, more like the, the the first piece I showed you, and uh, um, uh, pieces that were you know uh, more t more. Um, Uh, formally resolved, and I picked the one that was the most lopsided, uh, the most incomplete, um, 
the least period and feature attributable. Cut, scored, abraded with at least one uh, post casting uh, bit of plaster added to this foot so that she could, so she could stand in a reworked attitude. And I don't know whether you can see it in this picture, but these pencil notations by the artist, which just mean everything to me. So I chose the piece that brought me the closest to this man I could never have met, Aileen Odelman. And she once looked, you can see that she's looking out over her right shoulder. Um, she wants her looked directly, uh, frontally, there we go, toward us. Her face was here. And the artist reworked the piece to turn her gaze 90 degrees. Scraped away the old face, began to scrape in a new one. Carving away what had been her neck and her hair on the right to make it work. Way, whoops, sorry, back is which way? Ah! <laughs> no, it was that way. God, I'm a mess. Um, here we are. Carved way back into the shoulder and what had been her hair sloping out to her shoulders in order to get her uh, face and a new hairline clear and you know worked in uh, such a hurry and so thoroughly that he had to you know draw in the eyes on this new flat surface eyes and mouth and this uh, her bangs over her forehead and apparently intended to make this kind of crest on that you know yet again conical hat carve this new arm in out of what had been her torso, carved in a new neckline, indicated the hem of her uh, chemise. And she's apparently wearing this sort of uh, short jacket with these kind of horn, I don't dare go back, do I? Yeah, oof, shit. This, uh, this kind of, you know, horn, I don't know what you call it, the bottom of her blouse, which I can read of readily, sorry, um, readily identify with a, a newspaper tear out of, of Zonia Henny. Um, which has come down to us, as the art historians say. And the right eye, I'm going to read the last bit because I don't want to screw it up. And I want it to be a little clearer than the rest of this talk has been. Um, let's get back to the picture. And so this is the new reworked primary view across the right shoulder. <clears throat> the right eye was almost entirely the right eye here. Ah, oh, shit. God damn it. Uh, <laughs> Help. <laughs> ah, there we go. Why didn't I think of that? Right there. Yeah, that's fine. And now, now I'll. Okay. Yeah, this right eye was almost entirely lost in the process. <clears throat> and all of this, uh, you know, redecision and inconclusion and uh, 
working forward in definition is a half open door to me. Oh, thank God. This is the last slide. I know very well this is a hunk of plaster. It's a thing, an object, a work of art, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Nothing could be more obvious. And designedly so, the artist wanted it that way. But I take her as a person, a girl beckoning over her shoulder, come hither. Not a sound, not a word between us, but I know that I am brought near as if for a whisper and something in my hand. That's the story of influence. And now, I guess we'll leave that slide up and we can all relax and go to the questions. <laughs>